marvelous, wonderful, too beautiful for words. That's how I feel about you. Okay, we are, hold on, I just got to check. Tom's checking. I'm going to go like this. I've seen guys do that, that, you, that are used to wearing suits. I'm not used to it. I'm a t-shirter, dirty pants, and yet, underneath all that, you'll see a fine pair of silken undershorts caressing my noogies. <laughs> I said noogies. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. Not we a good are, We are. I was We're good? We're rolling? I didn't know. Hey. I'm just, I hey, you know what? I wake up and I go. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. Not a good looking man. Uh, okay. You are on the air. I am on the like what? Like it or not. On the internet. On the intranet. I'm on the on intranet. Yes! I was talking to my friend who was not a good looking man. And he told me that he won his first award at a biker party. And he won the award for a face that even a mother can't love. And I said, they have awards for that? He says, well, these bikers do. And I said, I want to roll with them guys. They sound like they're a lot of fun. Hey, uh, we like bikers. And you know, over the years, we've found that bikers are kind of like us. I remember an old biker named uh, Snooks. Great name for a biker, right? Snooks. What's your name? Snooks. And Snooks, uh, he was out in the Altoona area, and he owned a nightclub called The Coaches Inn. And we used to play there for him. Uh, this is back in the days of the Tigers in the 80s, and at the time, Whitey Cooper, and well, at that time, they had come from high school there. So this was even after they got out of high school. But uh, So they would come out, and their old, old friends out in the Altoona bikers would come out. I remember an old day go... That we used to hang out, name a Dago, a biker named Dago that used to know Snooks. Very good times. Very much fun doing shit we shouldn't have been doing with people we shouldn't have been doing it with. How you doing? Hey, uh, let's kick one in and uh, send ourselves off, right? Let's send ourselves off with a little licky. Jumping, pimps and hoes, but there's something missing. Chill you show, and at a party till you get here. When you arrive, everybody get turned up. The joint come alive. You'll make my blue disappear. And at a party till you get here. Lights are low, bands playing, dressed to kill, people swaying. Better than a party till you get here. When you arrive, everybody get turned up. The joint come alive. You make my blood disappear. And then a party till you get here. It ain't a party till you get here. Hey, hey. Spilling out into the parking lot. Inside the joint is too damn hot. But it ain't a party till you get here. When you arrive, everybody get turned up. The joint come alive. Who make my blue disappear? And it ain't a party till you get here. I hope I made myself perfectly clear. And it ain't a party till you. It ain't a 
entertain and party till you get here. Come on in. Hang with us. We want to touch you in a most manful way. I don't even know who I'm talking to. You might be a wealthy sort. You might ain't got a buck in your pocket. You might be wearing last week's underwear. <laughs> and if you are, I think I'd figure that out if I saw you. I'm pretty good like that. Uh, how crazy is it? Uh, Norman Nardini alone, when Tom and I started our, our little series here, we had no idea that we were going to spend this much time together. And we didn't really like each other. You know, um, didn't like each other at all, you know. And the thing with Tom is the more I've gotten to know him, the less I like him. And I just told him the other day, I says, Tom, you know what? I says, I don't know you all that well, but I already hate you like family. And he, um, he gave me the meanest look you could ever imagine. He gave me one, he gave me snot eye. You ever get snot eye? Well, you probably don't act like I do, so you probably don't get it. But me, I shoot my big mouth off. I come in the room acting like the biggest shot. You know, I always would tell myself, hey, I'm so tight when I walk in the room for other men. It spells doom and gloom because I come on so strong and stay on so long. Get over here. You're looking at the manful handful. Hey, um. Last week we talked about, uh, or two weeks ago, we talked about uh, the scenes around the clubs where exciting things happen. And I, I mean, I'm sure in any club, of any, even if it doesn't have music, has to have some type of scene to stay in business. So it has to have that human element coming in and out and rubbing up again one another and bringing folks they like and uh, spreading the beauty of it all. But in, mu in music bars, it's even more so. Um, and when, when it gets right, it, it kind of like gets like uh, everybody's supporting everybody else. You know, when, and sometimes uh, it ain't like that. But I, I'm thinking of like some clubs that we had uh, over the years. We had talked about Mike's Valley View. When we went in, in there with the Diamonds, they were doing all cover bands and good cover bands. But when we came in, we had gotten off the road and, and uh, we were like kind of lost souls and had lost our record deals and lost our management and didn't really know where we were going. And then we find this nightclub and people started showing up and ladies started dolling up, <laughs> putting on their high heels, sneakers, coming out, see the wop, the bop, WK, King of the Beat, Robbie Jones, the bead man. And the tight Mr. Frank Zori, they'd come out, they'd get dolled up and come out and see us. And we would burn shit down. We, were, we wasn't saving it for years later. I'm lucky to still be here, because it ain't like I saved it for now. When we were in the Diamonds, we brought it to the table and we chewed it up and ate it in front of everybody. And then you know what we did? We burped and farted. Right there in front of our mom and dad. <laughs> But the scenes at the clubs, you know, phase three, that was the scene there, and, and uh, which is the club right here in Swissville. It was in the old Toto's Hotel and Bar. And there was a scene there, and it was kind of like a punkish scene, but I was playing there with the Diamonds, and we hung in punk circles, but in Pittsburgh, in the punk scene, we were not considered uh, guys that they were in favor of because we weren't just part of that scene. The people they favored were just into the Pittsburgh punk scene. And they all came to the phase and kind of took it over and made it their club. And so it was cool. They had their scene. And although we were a part of that, we weren't really a part of it, which was perfect, you know. But uh, they supported each other, the punk scene. They're, they all had their arms around each other. And, uh, and I think a lot of those folks remember the phase real fondly. And another club that was totally like that was... Uh, uh, the Banana, which we didn't really play, but they had a great scene there, and, and folks really love the joint. They love Johnny and Judy Banana, and to this day, they're not uh, Johnny and Judy Zara. They're Johnny and Judy what? Banana. Banana. That's who they are, and it, it don't piss them off, because it's 
I think they, like the people that came there, hit from two different worlds. And it reminds me, now that I think about it, it reminds me of the Phase 3. Gino, the guy that owned the Phase 3 building, had no idea about rock and roll or punk rock. He was into disco and stuff. He was like an Italian from Italy. Really wonderful guy. Um, and, and, and like with the banana, Judy and Johnny didn't come into the scene being into punk music. They were into cuisine, right? And uh, But those scenes were bigger than the people involved and, and, and the humanity and those connections live on to this day. You know, like people build their lives from those things. And I wanted to talk today about a club that I don't mention often. And I should. Moon Dogs. Since the pandemic has come, been down four months now, be down the rest of the year. And uh, not just because me and Moondog have become uh, very tight and very close, but because of what happened through the years in Moondogs. Uh, if we don't talk about it, it doesn't get talked about. And, and, uh, and I think while the club's down, and while all clubs are down, it really gives us, all us nightlife people and all us music people and foodies uh, and comedy people, uh, it gives us all a chance to really see how much we miss and how much the scene of a club is huge. We live for that scene. Put it like this. Think about, you know, Father Francesc the priest at your church right now is he getting together with his flock does he get Sunday morning is it like a band when they all get together at the gig and they all meet up behind the building by the dumpster and, and somebody says who got one rolled and then they they enjoy a chaloon together and then they go in and give it hell is that what the priest does with the altar boys I don't think I don't know but what my point is, the priest is missing Sunday morning mass. Just like we're all missing. I'm missing my Friday night starlight. We're all missing the scene of it. Because that's the hum human connection that makes it high level. I was thinking about uh, Mooney's and I was thinking about some folks that have played there. Johnny Clyde Copeland, Texas Blues Master, Johnny Clyde Copeland, another Texas Blues master, Jimmy Vaughn, the older brother of Stevie Ray Vaughn, played there. Uh, I wrote a couple names down. How about Junior Wells? Junior Wells, Buddy Guy's partner. I, I don't know if I ever told you the story. I was in Boston. I was going to school back in 70, 71. Up in, at the, and anyway, I'm at this club called the Boston Tea Party, and I went to see Buddy Guy and Junior Wells do a duo hit at the Tea Party. And um, in the middle of their set, they started arguing with each other, and then they started beating the shit out of each other right on stage. And it's told me like that story. They had a fist fight right on stage. You're where I was that night. Yeah. <laughs> You're lucky you weren't there. Hey, you might have had to go kick some ass. But I was like a 21-year-old kid. And, and I saw this uh, insanity on stage and the craziness of it all. And I, and it, I was, I, I'll admit it, I was much more innocent than my years. You know, until I got older in life. I, I had a, in a, an innocence about me until I was well into my 20s. Um, but I saw that and it, and it frightened me so. But anyway, Junior Wells played and partied I remember at the end of the night, uh, Moondog said that uh, Lonnie Mack, how about Lonnie Mack played there? Mooney said at the end of the night, him and Junior Wells were partying in the back room and it was come get to be about four o'clock in the morning and, and Junior Wells' band come in who were younger guys and they said, Junior, hey, we'd like to get back to the hotel. And Moondog said, Junior Wells said, hey, it's my truck and it's my band. He says, we go when I say we go. He said, and then he stayed back there and drank with me for another hour or so before he went home. Took the band off. Do you love that? Junior F. and Wells, him and Buddy Guy beat the shit out of each other at the Boston Tea Party, 1970-71.
I'm sure there's some article in, in um, the Globe or one of them magazines or uh, papers about it. Bernard Allison and his father, Luther Allison. Yeah. Are you kidding me? I first heard of Luther Allison when I was around 1970, 71, when I was living in Boston. Because he was uh, real big up there. He wasn't really, he didn't have a presence in Pittsburgh at that time. He was more, b bigger in Europe. He spent a lot of his adult years in Europe. And he was one of them guys, not unlike myself, that liked to get on stage and go. You know, you there's not a lot of guys that when they, they, they not a lot of guys, when they take the stage, they take the stage. In other words, they get on stage, you know, they're, how long are we supposed to play? 40 minutes? And they get on stage, they play a couple, two, three, four hours. They just play. Um, Luther Allison was that guy. When he started playing, he just played. And that is a legacy to me that uh, it kind of defines a man. When the, If that's your legacy, it, what a great definition of who you are. Gives more than he takes. Fires it down. All his heart, all his soul. He doesn't want to get off stage. He ain't waiting for someone to say, oh, your set's over. He ain't looking for that guy. He's the guy that says, I'm here. Throw it on. I used to always say, take the stage like pirates capturing a ship. <laughs> you know... Tom's no talking Christmas. smart. He's talking smart. Take the stage like a pirate's capturing a ship. You know, there's something to be said for that us. That us thing. We, you know, it's like us. When we take the stage, you know, you go up there as a little team. You know, when, when I had my Tigers, you know, I've said it before. The Tigers was in a band that all the other band leaders were looking to steal my musicians from. They weren't the best known players, you know. They were my players. They bought into my system. We all knew we could hang out together. We didn't hate each other. Um, and we took the stage as a team. You know, before we go on stage, we'd always get together, put our hands together, and give a little tiger growl. Wow! And it was stupid, and we knew it was stupid. But it was what we wanted to do. And I, I used to tell him, I said, I want you, I don't want none of you guys having sex before the gig. I said, save that for later. I said, I don't want you to go up there satisfied. I want you to go up there looking at every chick thinking bad thoughts. Because I want you to be horny when you're up there. I don't want you coming out, out, straight out the hotel room walking on the stage. No. Stay away from things. You do your hit. And then you worry about satisfying yourself. You hear me now? Take the stage like pirates taking his ship. Tom, loving that. Uh, Leave on Helm played at Moondogs. Derek, Derek Trucks, Trucks played, played at Moondogs. Moondogs. I think when he was 14 or 15. Or 15. Moondogs, Moondogs, Moondogs saw him playing down at a bar in North, North Carolina. Carolina. And, and um, um, went up to his, the guy that was running his business at the time out of Florida and said, I want him to play my club. And they worked it out. And now Derek Strux is synonymous with the slide guitar. He is the slide guitar master that uh, Dwayne was. Only post Dwayne and all these years later and... Uh, He's got the chance to get older than Dwayne did. But greatness, right? So phenomenal. When he plays, Joe Bonamasso and Derek Trucks' wife, Susan Tedeschi, also played. Joe Bonamasso, who now is a big concert act. Moondogs. Jason Ritchie, the uh, harp player. One of the uh, premier harp players in the world. I mean, just breathtaking to watch him work. I've watched him work there a couple times and it's just, uh, and I've seen some great harp players. Did I ever tell you about the time I was at, at the Bear 
which was a bar restaurant in um, Bearsville, owned by Alan Grossman. And uh, Albert Grossman. I shouldn't. I'm sorry about that, Albert. Um, I was in there, and Paul Butterfield was hanging out at the bar. Do you love it? Butter. I want to go over to him and say, yo, Butter, what up? But I didn't. And who else do I saw at that same bar? A guy who's fantastic. We don't talk about him. Uh, the uh, the leader of uh, the Love and Spoonful. John Sebastian. John Sebastian. Great. Man, he wrote some high-level shit. How about Nashville Cats? How about Hot Time on some pink titties? Are you kidding me? Man, what a great record that was. How about another one? You know what another great Sebastian, John Sebastian song was? You didn't have to be so nice. I would have loved you anyway. Right there. I mean, just the flow of it, the easiness of it. It tells you the simple genius. Welcome back, Carter. Welcome back, welcome back. Love that shit. But Moon Dogs, man. Um, the eras of Moon Dogs. Leah, wonderful lady, who um, painted the do the dogs on the walls and painted the tables, and really artistically, and humanly wise too, because she's just a beautiful person. Gave the room um, a central feminine figure. And uh, for years, she was the face of day to day and, uh, and of the shows at the club. You know, um, Mary Bach, beautiful lady. Many years, she was the, uh, the workhorse of the joint. Shaking babies and kissing hands. How you doing? Nice to see you. Smack on the ass. And then in the last year's Billy. Yeah. You know, those those three women there, uh, especially, and with Leah kicking it off, you know, with the artwork. Uh, and Billy uh, following through all these years later, and Mary, you know, boom, there's 30 years. And uh, and there's three different lives that contributed greatly to uh, this very cool human experience that, you know, a lot of people, the happiest time of their week that week was the night they went out to see, you know, uh, a local band. The night they went out to see Glenn Pavone. The night they went out to see Donnie Zek with uh, Helene singing with him. Room to Move. Remember when they, they, they were a decade band, but they ended up working for Mooney. And uh, what a great local band they were. They were animals. White boys playing funky shit. With Donnie Zek out front, that crazy son of a bitch. Uh, he was the, uh, but I, I've said it before, back in the 80s when I was young and prowling and um, fighting to stay, uh, fighting to keep my place in the scene. Donnie was the first kid to come up that I turned around and looked at twice and says, yeah, this kid might be a problem. You know why? Because he, like me, sleeps between two slices of bread, he's such a ham. His hand bone was formidable. And I turned and look, looked at it a couple times. I said, this son of a bitch thinks he wants to be somebody because he had some juice. Meanwhile, he played his Corleone's off and he sang great, wrote great songs. Uh, but Moondogs, guys, now shut down for four months. Going to be basically shut down the rest of the year. And... Um, how much are we going to love it? How much? How are we going to hoot and holler when Mooney's comes back up? From the depths of degradation, the 30 years of humanity in and out, the sweat, the spit, the piss and vinegar of the room, and the guys getting up on stage, the ladies getting up on stage, Maria Moldar. I think, you know... Um, if she married an Italian, her name might become Maria Maldini. <laughs> Remember, she used to, uh, Midnight at the Oasis. Meanwhile, she married Jeff Moldar, 
who was a great acoustic musician, like an acoustic blues guy. And that's how she became a Moldar, I believe. She married Jeff Moldar. Yeah, she's Italian. She's yeah, yeah, she has a look of a an Italian sister. I can't, just can't place the name. Maldini. Maybe, no. perhaps, I mean, I don't know. What the yeah. hell? But um, how crazy is that, right? And she had the guitar player. If you ever listen to Midnight at the Oasis and listen to the guitar work on her, Amos Garrett, a Woodstalker, yeah. plays the living shit out of some lickety dickety do. You feel me now? Nah! One of those guitar players that was so lyrical and, and so uh, so melodic, and there were so many great ones at that time. I always think of Jesse Ed Davis. Yeah. I think of that guy that was with uh, James Taylor. What the hell was his name? Danny. Uh, Danny Cooch. Danny Cooch. Korshmeyer. Yeah, yeah. I seen him play this Danny with the Fugs. Yeah. At the Stanley Theater, he played guitar with the Fugs with a bass player and drummer, and was the best guitar player on the show that night. The Grateful Dead were on that show, and this guy, of all the musicians on this, I think the Velvet Underground as well. But the guy on the show that had the most juice was this Danny. He was licking it up. I just thought. So, ladies and gentlemen, when you go to bed tonight and you take your meat in your hands, oh, I shouldn't have said that. When you go to bed tonight, say a little prayer for moon dogs. I, I remember um, I was thinking about playing at Mooney's. Open it up for Pete Best. The effin' original drummer of the effin' Beatle, Beatles. Uh, we opened the show for Pete um, at Mooney's. It was so, so cool. We opened up a show. Me and Harry opened up for David Lindley, um, Jackson Brown's guitar player. We did a show with him not that many years ago. And he played by himself, and me and Harry did a little duo thing. And it was just delicious. I mean... All the, uh, how about all the Pavone shows at Moondogs? You know, there's a, uh, an underground recording floating around of Pavone playing at Moondogs, like a couple, two nights, a few hours worth of music that might end up one day be, being released for everybody. And how much do we need to hear that? Uh, when we think about Moondogs, we can transition very easily into thinking about Mr. Glenn Pavone, who passed away 10 years ago uh, just the other day, and who um, a lot, most of the real music people in this time simply loved and kind of idolized and worshipped all at the same time. You know, when Glenn passed on at the church service, I was asked to speak, and I spoke a little bit very in a very serious way. The clown of Pittsburgh rock and roll spoke in a serious way. Uh, also speaking that day was uh, Tom Valentine and uh, Frank Spritz, the drummer. Two much guys considered much more serious than me, but they spoke in a humorous fashion about Glenn, and they told this story. In the church, they told they they were had a gig, a three piece gig at the Mouse Trap, like on a weeknight or whatever. And it was like ten o'clock. They were supposed to hit. Nine thirty comes, Glenn ain't there. Um, Frank and Val were ready to go. Club's ready. Everything's going on. Nobody shows up. Nine thirty. Finally, ten minutes to ten, Glenn Pavone comes walking in the door looking all disheveled, like with little blood spots on his face and kind of weirded out. And he comes in and gets in and gets ready to go up and play. And then later that night, he tells them the story. He says, the reason I was late is because on the way to this gig, which was out in the country, I hit a deer. And he said, and when I hit this deer, I pulled over and the deer was laying on the side of the road. He said, I pulled over and I got out of the car and I walked over to where the deer was and I told him I was sorry. And I said to him, 
because when when he hit the deer, it hit the uh, front of the the like the side of the deer, and then the deer plopped up and hit the windshield, and the windshield smashed, and all these little shards of glass went and hit Glenn in the face. So his face was like a little bit bloody and weird looking, and. Uh, so he says, but when, it went, when I went over to the deer, I went over and I apologized to him for hitting him. And I told him I was sorry. And uh, he says, right as I was talking to him, the deer shook his head and looked at me. And he said, and he just very calmly got up and walked off into the woods. And then he says, so he says, so I got in the car and drove to the gig and I'm a little bit late. He says, but he says, it's all good. Um, and when you think about it, it ain't no, it's, it's not an accident that Glenn stopped the car, got out, and apologized to the deer for hitting it. That's the kind of person he was. It's a real deal. And that's why he was so loved by everyone that knew him, because he was just a gentle sort. And, uh, but when he played guitar, he was not a gentle sort. He was a mean and nasty son of a bitch. He had the fire of, uh, that only a few that I've ever seen in my life have. Uh, but he also had musicianship. He was uh, a great ensemble player. Like you didn't know how great Glenn was until it came time for a solo. If you were watching it, like, I mean, a, 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 a pro would know instantly at the level, because he always played at the exact right volume. He always knew when not to play. He always knew what part to play. Those kinds of things were instinct for him. But when he, when everybody would get out of his way and it was time for Glenn to blow, it really was like the snapping of a finger and now a little minor miracle was released because everything about it, every solo he played sounded like he thought about it and planned it out. Uh, every note that he bent to was bent to exactly where he wanted to bend it. And uh, and as soon as the solo was over, he tucked himself right back into the rhythm section, out of the way of the words and the melodies. And it was just, he really was a, a one of a kind. And I can say it because I've played with a lot of different people all over the country. And, and so I've rubbed up again a lot of really high level players, but ain't none of them better musician and with more fire in his shorts Pavone 10 years ladies and gentlemen we need, we need to, to um, you know, you know Moon and I we're talking, we're talking about, about doing something for, something for uh, the 10 years, years of uh, when, when Glenn, Glenn passed, passed. so if so you if think, think of, of it, it uh, shoot Mooney a little note that says uh how much you love Glenn Pavone. And it would make him feel good because him and me are both huge uh, members of the Glenn Pavone fan club. How you doing? Because I'll come right. The... My buddy told me he likes his guitar. This is a uh, little Mexican Martin. Let's just call it a little Chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I got to think for Chihuahuas now that we have one. It ain't just because L. Wood one, L. Woods had one in um, Legally Blonde. She had a Chihuahua in that movie. Wrote this with Whitey Cooper back about 88, 89. I remember when we wrote it, we were sitting in the living room. The dining room of our house on Woodstock, on Hoodstock Avenue over in Swiss Vale. And while we were writing it, the house behind us caught on fire and we watched it burn to the effing ground while we were writing this song. <laughs> took you out on a town I didn't mean to bring you down 
Because I was just trying to show you a real good time. Now ain't that little French restaurant? You turned your head and you walk out. Because I was drinking beer instead of wine. Now ain't that just like a good woman? Ain't that just like a good woman? And it's just like a woman, she really blew your mind. Now when I took you to the movie show, you said you really, really wanna go. But then the curtain went up, and it changed your mind. I took you on my last match. Surprise. Now ain't that just like a woman? Ain't that just like a woman? Ain't that just like a woman? She really blew your Kick it in the behind Like a woman How you, How doing? you doing? Ain't, Ain't that, that just, just like a woman? woman. You know, you know uh, when you, when you really think, think about it, the yin and the yang of it. The bing and the bang of it. Mm-hmm. Somebody knew what they were doing when they figured all this out. Somebody much smarter than I. <laughs> Ain't that just like a woman? Now that particular piece of music was on the um, this old train record, and I don't know if I told you, but when we uh, did the this old train record, we didn't know what we were going to name the record, and we had a song that was going to be on the record. The name of the song was "Living in the Lap of Luxury." Uh, and what we did was we had photos taken of uh, above the studio on Waverly Transport Studios above the studio my friend Ralphie lived there and he was like a real bohemian manimal and he had a combination kitchen bathroom uh, that he <laughs> that he lived it was like a man a man apartment and so he had just like a little room and there, there was like a uh, a train track all around the room so if you want to get out of the door you had to duck down and go under the train track but it was like about neck high this train track this just went around the outside of the room and it's really crazy and then he had a toilet and right beside the toilet was his toaster and beside that was the sink where he washed dishes and then you know the it was all right in there and so we had pictures taken inside the lap of luxury which was the combination kitchen bathroom right do you love that yeah, your lady would stand for that, right? She'd like it. Yeah, I bet. Uh, but those pictures didn't come out, so it ended up becoming uh, definitely this old train. And then we didn't even put that song on the record because we didn't use the title, but we were thinking about it. It was really cool. 
Uh, man, am I glad to be here. I can't tell you how much I miss rubbing up against people. How much, like I was talking about the priest Sunday morning. What's he doing? He's walking around the, the monastery. Ain't that what they, where the priest lives in the monastery? He's walking around the monastery in circles. Um, uh, like this here, looking for the wine, looking for the wean cabinet. Because you got no one to touch. You can't get out and rub up again, nobody. I was talking to my buddy the other day. And he's a younger guy and a hip guy. And uh, and very much in, up with today's music, but raised by uh, people in close to my age group. Uh, so he's hip to the music from my generation and the generation behind me, but he's probably like around 30-ish. But knows a lot about music from before his, before his time and a lot about what's going on today. And he's been operating this club scene and uh, bringing in different bands and bringing in kind of like knowing about the heavy music, something I know nothing about or don't really have messed with at all. I, I don't understand it. But he's been bringing in all these heavy bands. And recently I saw this guy and he says, yeah, I got to tell you something. I says, what's up? He says, he says, excuse me, he says, I've been doing sound at the club. And he said, and we had this band come in. He says, he says, I, he says, they had a nice following, he says, but they didn't play any music at all. He said, when they would play their guitars, it was so distorted, you couldn't even, t he says, they would change chords and you couldn't tell the chord changed. And the bass sounded like as noisy, as much noise on it as the guitars did. And he said he had a drummer that just bashed and didn't really even play beats. And he said, and they had a singer who just screamed at the top of his voice. And, uh, he said, I, I've never seen anything so anti-musical. Anti <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, because this is the same, the same guy, guy he could appreciate, you know, Taj Mahal. Or, you know, you know, Kev Moe playing, Mo playing, playing a show. show. You know what I mean? So he, he, has, he has a vast understanding, understanding of what's, what's going, going on. on. So anyway, he says, he did the sign check with the band, and, and he says, when the sign, and he said, he just didn't know what to do was, you know, doing sign. He said, and when the sign check was over, he says, the lead singer come over to him and said, hey, man, uh, How's it sound? And he, and he said, I just went like this. Yeah. <laughs> he said, I didn't know what the fuck, to, I didn't know what to say. And it was just funny because uh, it wasn't a guy from my generation saying it. It was a guy from, you know, the current times saying it. He said, how's it sound? Yeah. Are you loving it? Me too. Uh, man, we're glad to be here. Certainly glad to be here. I had some songs I was going to play today, so let's do one. One of the things I wanted to do was uh, something I wrote uh, in the last year or two. I don't like to send it out to the memory of Glenn Pavone. Glenn, the big cheese, Pavone. You know what he said to me one day? He says, man, he says, I'm a connoisseur of fine Subaru station wagons. And he was serious. The father, pure of heart, stood by me from the start. Missing both, she said, been gone. Left me here, keeping on. Seeing when I get there, think I can pay the fare. Heard it's nice up there, I'll see him when I get there. Friends of mine, was good as gold, had angel wings, truth be told. Bound for glory, 
touched by the hand Now they're living in a promised land I'll see them when I get them I won't know what to wear I'll just pull up a chair when I get them Where I'm going, I'll be home. No longer will I roam. Life I lived wasn't by the book. I got ghosts back there. Trigger shook. Dungeon door, pearly gate. Call my name, clear my slate. I'll see you when I get there We'll have a grand affair Get on a chair when I get there I'll see you when I get there We'll throw our hands in the air Like we just don't care when I get there I'll see you when I get there Well, well See you when I get there I'll see you when I get there Hey See you when I get When I get there See when I get there Yeah baby And here we are East Side Sound Studio 2053 Monongahela Avenue Swissville Pencil Tuck Oh yeah Right up the street from the triangle. How do you like that? that. No, no, we, we, we shot, shot the, the uh, pictures, pictures for the, the uh, Northern 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 Tigers. Tigers. We, we shot, shot them, them right, right in, the, in trunk. the trunk. And at the time, there was like a kind of like a local street street guy named Brownie that was hanging out, and uh, he was there the whole time we were doing it and uh, drinking beers. Love it, right? I remember, I'm sure there'll be some folks that watch what we're doing today and they'll go, I remember Bronny. He was a handful. I think he used to live at Toto's, which was the club that ended up becoming the Phase 3. Because they had like a hotel there where locals would live. Remember you used to be able to do that? I remember when I was 18 years old, or 19...
<laughs> Wait, there it is. It's back. We're back. <laughs> We all right. I'm sorry about all of the confusion. Hey guys, uh, we're back. We were we were down for about five or seven minutes or so. Um, we got our shit figured out. We are right here with you now, and we want to get with y'all. And during that five or seven minute break, I should have been thinking about what I wanted to do, right? I should have been. Um, let's do one. Uh, wrote this in the past year or so. Down in the basement. And um, I am not sure where... The, the, the line of the song is uh, I'm looking for a circus, looking for a clown. And because somebody, somebody said something to me like... Uh, and I just says, yeah. Hey, I'm a clown looking for a circus. And then, I, and I thought, well, what a great um, premise for a song. And then I, th then when I started working it, it was, I'm, I'm looking for a circus that's looking for a clown. That's the way the lines came out. And uh, see what you think of it. And the music is, is kind of a, a little bit creepy, which I like a lot. <laughs> In the mirror, what do I see? Face of a clown looking at me. Ain't good for much, more than a laugh. Jokes that have cracked, you don't know the half. And you can tell the ringmaster that I'm in town. And I'm looking for a circus, looking for a clown. It's hard to find Barnum and Bailey Come to mind If they are looking For a man that's funny I'll be under the big top Making my money That's the way I see it Going down And I'm looking for a circus Looking for a clown Like me, been everywhere that day is Jersey Shore, nothing but smile in the roadhouse. They roll in the hour. You can talk to my agent and he'll set you straight. Tell you I was clowning right out of the gate. Aim to please, got a need to amuse just to hear. Take away your blues and you can bet your sweet ass. I've been around and I'm looking for a circus. Looking for a circus. Looking for a circus. Looking for a clown. Looking for a circus, looking for a clown. How you doing? Uh, kind of exciting, right? That dot right there is a delicious little piece of music. I've got to have a few more dances with. I think that number and I are going to get out on the floor once we get back to normal. We're going to be getting out on the floor and just dragging it across the dance floor. Bang! But a boom, meat shaking. The other day, I went down in my basement and I dug up a book for 1979. I don't know what you were doing in 1979, but I know what I was doing. I was ending up my relationship with the diamonds and I was starting the Tigers. 
Here's a couple of things I just wrote down. On January 5th, 1979, my wonderful, dear friend, Robbie the Beadman Joms, quit the Diamonds and played his last gig. And that gig was where? Mancini's. Uh, crazy, right? On uh, January 16th, I had a meeting with uh, John McGann, who at the time was the program director of WDVE uh, when radio was active and exciting and uh, relevant. And he and I talked about doing some things together. We'll talk about him a little bit more. On February 9th, I remember playing Burning Up at Maury Speakeasy. And I was still playing with the Diamonds. And, uh, and I remember that it kicked ass and it gave me a luxurious thrill. And it, I felt a thrill that I hadn't felt before. A new high that uh, was just delicious. March 20th, 1979, I went to New York City to have a meeting with a publishing company. Uh, a wonderful gentleman, a uh, European guy named Nico Anducic about doing a publishing deal for my music, the stuff I was writing at the time. And uh, and I remember later, Nico came to Pittsburgh to hang out with us. And me and him and my old lady, we all went to the stinking Lincoln. And I remember, after we come out of the stinking Lincoln, all effed up, we're uh, in my van, and, and Nico goes like this. In his European accent, he goes, may I have drink of joint? I would like drink. Because we were smoking joints and he wasn't smoking dope with us. But after getting a couple a couple in his belly at the stinking, he said, drink of joint? Even to this day, sometimes we'll look at each other and go, may I have drink? April 21st. Was the last Diamonds gigs? Oh, okay. Well, January 5th was Beadsman's last Diamonds gig, but that was at the Valley View. But on... Uh, April 21st was the last Diamonds gigs all together. And that was at Mancini's. What a great room, right? Robert. Was he Anthony? Nikki? The boys? And the old man, Gassy. Uh, on June 12th, I had a recording session. Uh, starting to cut music. With the Diamonds being gone, I was starting to put myself together. I forgot May 24th. On May 24th, how could I forget that? It was my first gig as Norman Nardini. And it was at Swissville High School. It was a gig that Robbie Johns' little brother Dave put together because he was in that class. And they were looking to hire a band. And so he ended up playing drums for me. And it was me, Warren, Ray Gunn, and David played. And that was my first gig as a, I wouldn't call me a singer. Let's say I was a vocalist and uh, a very rough guitar player. But once again, I got a great feeling after that show as well. Similar to that when I said I played Burning Up when I was still with the Diamonds. Uh, I got these new feelings that I never, because I had never been out front before. I never felt like I had anything to offer. On July 29th, we hired uh, Derek Edwards as our drummer because David Johns uh, wasn't going to be working with us anymore. Uh, and we really missed him, but we were glad to have Derek. Uh, so that was... Uh, on April 3rd, we played, on August 3rd, we played with the Romantics at the Decade and scared them a little bit, more than a little bit, I would think. Because they were nice guys and they, they were, you know, had nice suits on. And, but you know what? They didn't have no anger in their belly. They didn't have the kind of anger in their bellies that we had in our. They didn't have the kind of dark desires. They didn't have an aching in their loins that we had as the Tigers. We were a sorry bunch of man meat. How about this one? On September 24th, the first copies of the singles of Burning Up came in. Are you kidding me? Right? Uh, there was a Burning Up on one side. Then on the other side, I think there were two songs, Psycho and Ready Freddy. That's what I'm thinking. I remember on November 4th, I flew to Florida to... Uh, Hang out with my friend Scott Tallarico. We were talking about doing some business together. And Scott ended up putting us, 
putting a show together for us in February of 80 at uh, CBGB's in New York City. But after flying to Florida, then I flew up to Cleveland to meet the band and play a gig at a place called uh, Hennessy's in Cleveland, which was a really cool rock and roll room. It really was. November 24th that year, we played at Fat City, and that's the night that I wrote uh, Nothing to Lose. November 24th, 1979. That song's been around since then. And still, playing that song, chubbing, firming up, formation. December 14th, I think, of that year was the first time I ever played the decade. 79. December 21st of that year, we played in Cleveland with the Baloney Heads, which was a great... Uh, configuration of nutbags uh, of Cleveland guys and uh, who were really good to us and um, we played a mess of shows with them uh, I think the following night after that show we played Fat City with them here in Pittsburgh but they were really good guys to hang with and uh, had a, a scene of, of nutbag friends in Cleveland that they shared with us that uh, we probably never really even thanked them for but we should on December 31st of that year, we played uh, Fat City. How do you like that? We played Fat City New Year's Eve. Wow. Bringing in the 80s? Are you kidding me? Hey, guys, you can download Norman Nardini Music, whole LPs, single tracks, and you can get a whole LP for under $10 on Amazon or iTunes. Uh, and the albums that we have available were Notorious, Bonafide, Redemption, It's Alive, Breakdown, and This Old Train. The Breakdown is Breakdown of Paradise. But yeah, all those uh, LPs are available, or singer track, single tracks from those LPs are available. So if you're, you're into the music, or, or you're into uh, finding any specific songs, that would be um, where you could do it. Um, let's do a song. Let's do a song about uh, another story song. How about let's talk in it out first, then we'll play it. Sometimes I have trouble doing that. I don't know if anybody out there does uh, the gigs, but when you gig, sometimes, this sounds really crazy to say, but sometimes if you do a song, at a gig and then somebody makes you play that same song again like within a half hour or an hour you screw it up the second time you play it I don't know why that is um, but uh, something about I guess being a live musician and, and and just going you know I think people that read music have a different set of problems than guys that just play which would be the club I'm in of guys that just play <laughs> 